Thank you, Sister Kemi, for uh, edifying our children and in turn edifying us, the parents. May God bless you for that ministry. I want to... And to thank God for the protective hand he has rested upon you across the week and drawing you in his tabernacle for the living word. I want to respect you all in your respective degrees and to thank God for the ministry is causing you to accomplish. I realized that when the elder mentioned that I have five children, almost some people are about to die. That's why I had given Elder a trick that he would say I have two boys and three girls. In that way, they don't appear so many. But we thank God because the Lord is good. I am blessed to, to have the privilege to nurture five young souls for Christ. And guess what? One of them, Benjamin... Thank you. I. <clears throat> One of them today is his birthday. Can you imagine? When the father is preaching and the boy is celebrating a new year. Benjamin, I want to say with this opportunity I have that you are treasured and loved. And we hope that God will continue to shine his face upon you so that you can become a soldier for no one but Christ. I want to thank my wife, who in good and bad, in humiliation and in praise, who in failure and victory still stands by my side as a voice of encouragement and steering me on to press on until Jesus comes. I want to thank you, Rachel, and I hope the Lord will continue to bless you. I also want to thank the leaders of the church and the university for bearing the burden of us in prayer and in leadership. May God bless you abundantly. It is 6.20, and allow me therefore to inform you that you are really recognized, and I want to turn your attention to the word of God. My subject this afternoon is simply entitled, and it's captioned from a question that arises when I read the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 22 to 23. And my subject that I want to reflect with you is a question which I have captioned, how good is your eye? A troll behind the scenes, how good is your eye and my eye? And I draw this from Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Jesus, in one of the most cardinal statements that he offers, he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. My deduction therefore is that if your eye is not good, then In other words, you are as qualitative as your eye is. You are as good as your eye is. And this is a strange thing to think about. Martin J. Alika was a former board of chairman monitor publication, which is uh, an organization that brings to us the dailies that we read, the daily monitor. And in 2017, October 19th, he published an article in the Observer, which he titled, In the World of Newspaper, Heads You Lose, Tails You Lose. In the World of Newspaper, Heads You Lose, Tails You Lose. And to caption and illustrate what he's talking about, he gave a story that I want to share with you. He says, one day, I got a telephone call from the government demanding to know why NTV was showing a gruesome picture of a person shot by police in a riot. We are talking about the government of Uganda in this context. I was told to fire the journalists who had taken that photograph and the person airing the pictures. I strode to the studio, every bit a big chairman. 
Soon all the employees in the studio at the time were seated in front of me. I told them why I was there and what I was going to do, and that is to sack them. One courageous member of staff, thank God for these courageous members of staff, one courageous member of staff stood up and addressed me directly saying, Sir, before you sack us, we would like to give you a glimpse and show you what we have not shown the public. We are going, we are sure, thank you, we are not resisting. But allow us before we go to show you what is behind the scenes. So they rolled the reels so that he can have a clear glimpse of what is going on. And this is what he says. They rolled the reel and I saw a woman holding her intestines. I threw up. She was holding her intestines in her hands as she dies. And, and, and the, the young man says to the manager, the chairman board, he says, this we did not show. What you saw of someone short is only but a glimpse of what we have. And he ends his article with this wonderful statement that challenged my brain. He says, the public has no idea what the journalists get to know. What we see in the papers, so he says, is only 10% of what has been kept out of the papers. Now I say to myself, suppose my source of information is the newspaper and the news on TV. I'm as informed as 10%. For example, if you... Your source of information has only been the newspaper. I want to tell you, my brother, you are very informed, but to the degree of 10%. And then the challenging question came, what happens to the 90%? Where is it? How can I get to know? How can I have an interrogation of it? How can I also interface with it? You see, situational factors determine what you receive. Let me even tell you, even as pastors, what we tell you is only but. Maybe you didn't get me. I can speak as much as the situation context can permit. This is why many people write when they have retired. When people retire, they write many things. Even me, I will write when I retire, if I'm still alive. And, 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 and I want to submit to you that people, when I remember a colleague of mine when we were in school in the Philippines from Zimbabwe, told me that when he went to the central church of Zimbabwe, the central uh, district, he preached a sermon, and after the sermon, he received a note that told him that the president, Mugabe, at that time, was pleased with the way he was preaching that he should continue like that. Don't he uh -uh, continue like that. So there are circumstances that define what you say. And I can go as much as I can go now. But if you were to talk about things, there are many things we can talk about. And that is why individually you must have a good eye to search them out. Because not everyone will give them to you. And therefore this afternoon my quest and burden is to take you a little behind the scenes and show you that it is bigger than what you see it is bigger if you knew what was behind the scenes we could not behave the way we behave something will change about our approach to life if only we got a glimpse of what is behind the scenes let me pray and take you behind the scenes a little bit. Our Heavenly Father, the time has come and the situational context sometimes limit us in speaking to the entirety of truth. But even you, Lord, you say to the disciples many things I desire to say unto you, but you cannot contain them. 
And so you are aware, Lord, that much could be said, but it also depends on the absorption capacity. But this morning, we open ourselves up to your revelation, loving Father. Speak through me to your people as a vessel. May your name be magnified, I pray, in Jesus' name. When the times were tough, and a man was burdened to show what was going on behind the scenes, a gentleman by the names of George Orwells in 1945 penned and wrote a book called The Animal Farm. When you read that book, surely you cannot say he's talking about animals. Even when you are not educated, you, you, you really will do somehow sense that is describing a situation that is real. I also chanced on reading another book called The Tale of Two Cities, which is a novel, but with the historical perspective of the French Revolution, written by Charles Dickens. Another gentleman that struck me and wrote a book that revolutionized my thinking is a man called Jack Perkins, John Perkins. He wrote a book entitled The Confession of the Economic Hitman. He has published a new one. He published a new one in 2016, The New Confession of the public and in that he describes what is behind the scene in the political and economic world but this day i'm interested in a man that wrote a book that came to my desk i think god wanted me to read it my wife will, where she works received a book from one of the superiors and he said to her, go and read this book, it's very interesting. Now she came back home and that book is big, it's about 600 pages. And she does not have time to do that. She has to prepare for children and all these things, 600 pages of things that don't relate to work. Ah, she said, no, this is too much. So the book stood on the shelf. But one of the days, the, it seems the, the, the owner of the book wanted it. So now we had trouble. How can you return a book that has stayed with you for these days and you have never read it? So since I'm the husband, it is the fame, the name of the house that is in uh, trouble. <laughs> and it is always men that suffer in such circumstances. So I decided to sacrifice myself. How oh, I love my wife. My wife, you know now. I sacrificed my brothers and I determined that I would read it. At first, my intention was to read to get a summary so that when she returns it and they ask what is in the book, she can say a few things. There is a man called so-and-so. He did this and this, and he did this and that. But when I began reading the book, my friend, I was grooved, and now the motive changed. My motive now was to get information. This book is written by a man called Dan Brown. He's a very controversial writer because he's the one that wrote a book called The Da Vinci Code that purports that Jesus has a bloodline that shook the theological world. But he has written another book called Inferno. The book called Inferno is premised on the poem of a famous artist called Dante Alighieri. Dante writes a poem and describes his journey to hell. And he's guided to hell to see what is in hell. And he says hell is a place on earth that has nine consecrate spheres. And each sphere has human beings, eh? depending on the degree of your sins. So the greedy might be in the first sphere. Then you have these notorious ones. Eh? And Satan is at the center. So you approach, the, <laughs> the more you approach Satan, the more degree your sin is also. And, and so he writes this book and this poem and this author picks it from there and crafts a story on historical evidence, but fictitious, so he says. And I know why he says it is fictitious, because situational context does not allow you to write literary. You must write. And let me just summarize what's in that book so that you get to know where we are as well. In the book, there is the main actor is a professor of art history and symbiology at Harvard University. His name is Robert Langdon. Robert is being employed by the World Health Organization, especially the director of World WHO, Elizabeth Sinsky. And he, she has a problem on her hands. 
there is a gentleman called Bertrand Zobrist. He has developed something that is going to destroy the world. And he has hidden the code in the works of Dante. So to find out where he has hidden it, you have to have an awareness and the knowledge of art history. So they employ the Harvard professor to help and defuse this bomb. Now this Bertrand comes from the school of thought. This World Health Organization director goes to the UN convention to present a paper on the pandemic progress in the third world countries. And after presentation, she receives a note that she's invited to the Council of Foreign Relations. The Council of Foreign Relations is a body that was established in 1920 with the aim of studying the challenges of the world, especially in three, in six categories. I will only mention three, education, health, and energy. And so they, they developed a think tank that is supported by the three wealthiest persons, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and Rothschild. Their duty is to study the challenges that surface and challenge the human race. And therefore, he, she is invited to that convention to the head offices, and she wonders what him is the cause. And when she gets there, she meets this guy, Bertrand Zobrist, a rich man. And the man begins telling her the problem. She says, you are the leader of the World Health Organization but you are wasting time in non-entities. The real problem of this world is not what you are dealing with. You are dealing with non-entities, but neglecting the real problem. And she asks, what is the real problem? And Zobrist begins the story from Bishop Malthus, who once was challenged and argued that the world population cannot be contained with the natural resources we have if it continues to grow at the rate at which it grows. So this man speaks to the lady and gives her facts. Fact number one, from the day the world was established to 1800, it, on, it took thousands of years for the population to get to one billion. From 1800 to 1920, it took only 100 years for the world to double the population. From one billion, we went to two billion in 1920. And from 1920 to 1970, the world doubled to four billion. The projection is by 2020, the world will be in nine billion. So the man says in mathematics, we call that geometric progression that the population will increase growth in a shorter time. And the problem is here. As the population grows, people will begin to fight for resources. That means evil will increase. People will be stealing to feed their families. And therefore, we will lose humanity as we know it, as each one will ravage another. And so the story goes. The lady says, what is your proposal? He says, my proposal is like that of John Nakmara. We either accelerate death because we have realized birth control does not work. The World Health Organization director said that is evil. He says, what is the better evil? <laughs> what is the better evil? For the world to continue growing and all of us destroy each other or for us to deliberately eliminate some. This man was a genetic engineer by profession and a doctor at that. So when the World Health Organization director refuses to buy what he's proposing, because he was rich, he went ahead and recruited young, finest brains in genetic engineering and they engineered a pathogen. So the World Health Organization gets wind that the man has developed a sinister, destructive virus. And they begin hunting for it. That's why the professor of Harvard is hired, to avert the catastrophe that is almost befalling the world. And they look for it, and guess what? They discover where it is. But they are 10 days, seven days late. The virus has been released to the people. It is like coronavirus. 
it spreads like wildfire. But what surprises them is that people are not dying. So they say, what is the problem here now? And the good thing is that one of those students and intelligent young people that had been coerced in the development was now on the side of the World Health Organization. She says, let me explain what the man did. The man also did what the population is doing. What he did, he developed a virus, but this virus is not like this one of yours. This one is called a vector virus. They said, speak on. This virus does not kill people. What does it do? This virus is a vector virus, and vector virus, what they do is that it enters a human being, and then it enters into the cell of the human being in the gene and alters the DNA. So he programmed it in a sense that it will only allow one third of the human population to procreate. The rest will not. I'm, this is fiction. Eh? It is not true. It is not true. It's fiction. So a third will populate, but two thirds will look for babies. It's like coronavirus. You, you breathe into another, you get sick, so the entire population population will get it because it's following a progressive geometric mathematics model. So now, the trouble is, how do you deal with that kind of virus? As I was preparing this, I thought I was going to tell you a fiction. Even me, I was convinced it is a fiction. And then on Facebook, one of my friends is Bill Gates. <laughs> I'm a rich man also. I'm in the circle of rich people. <laughs> so Bill Gates is my friend. Can you believe, brothers? <laughs> Bill Gates is my friend. So this week, he shared a piece. And he was encouraging us, his friends, to read some books he found very useful. There are five of them. But one interested me, uh, seriously. And the title of that book is The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing and the Future of the Human Race. Now, I thought this was a fiction, but when I read the review, the review says it's a non-fiction. Let me tell you about this gentle lady called Jennifer Doudna. She won the Nobel Prize of 2020 in chemistry. And the work that led her to win that Nobel Prize is the work in the study of genes and DNA modification. Let me read a little bit of what I read as the caption of her uh, profile for the Nobel Prize. The landmark research that brought this lady, Doudna, and her partner, Charpentier to the pinnacle of global acclaim has the potential to control the future of pandemics like COVID. And it does it in either two ways. Number one, either by outwitting the next viral plague through better screening and treatment, or number two, by engineering human beings with better disease resistance programmed into their cells. The technique of gene editing they patented is called CRISPR-Cas9. It makes it possible to selectively snip and alter bits of DNA as though there were so many hames to take up and others to leave. And this is what um, a review Bill Gates gave. He said that now we are on a landmark. <laughs> we, are, we are going to the next level. We are going to produce, if you want a beautiful girl, eh? these days it's not trial and error. With this breakthrough, we can just alter the DNA, then you produce a... <laughs> Hallelujah. If you want intelligent, intelligent people, we are tired of lumpens. We are tired of these people who can't reason. We want people like... Hey. So we just alter DNA a little. Tink. 
and the people are like sharp. Now this is real. And he said, now the discussion is not whether it's possible, but the discussion all is on the ethics. I only came here to tell you some things are bigger than what you think. And they are out there for us to read. A gentleman called Geno Zhu <coughs> wrote a book called The Art of War. And in that book, he makes the following statement. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not to fear the results of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer loss. If you know neither your enemy nor yourself, every battle you will succumb, for you, you are indeed foolish. It is important to know your enemy and what he's talking about. And that's why Jesus says, when your eye is good, when your eye is, is opened up to see what is behind the scenes, you become intelligent in your choices, in your investment, even in the things that you spend time in. You see, Jesus employed this technique in the book of John chapter 2, verse 23 and 25. John chapter, 20, chapter 2, verse 23 and 25. This is what I read now. Now I have gone to the scripture to hell with the books on gene editing. Now it is the word of God. The Bible says that now when he was in Jerusalem, that is Jesus, at the Passover, during the feast, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. And why? Because he knew all men. And no one need that anyone should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. He knew that man can praise you and at the same time stab you in the back. I, I joke with my colleagues sometimes and tell them, those who are in leadership in their organization, I say, be careful. Some people only love your pen and not you. The day you lose the position, they will not even call to greet you. Jesus was aware of what was in man and would not be carried away by the praises of man because he knew what man is capable of. His ministry was not augmented on whether they praise him or not. His ministry was augmented on the mission of his father. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 to 11, the Bible says, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, in verse 10 he says, Now whom you forgive anything, I also. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 10 to 11. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one, that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. In other words, Paul is saying, the first thing I was able to certify was the fact that I know exactly how the devil behaves. And therefore, I do not give the devil a chance to take advantage of what I have in my life. So Paul says, even if I am not convinced, I forgive so that the devil does not take advantage of our back and forth. But let me take you to the book of Revelation and highlight just a few things before I bring you to where I want you to take note of. The Bible says in verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. 
But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, allow me in this moment to draw your attention to just the direction. In this passage, the center of our motion and observation is the dragon. The dragon is waging war with Christ, Michael, in the heavenly places. And the Bible tells us that he did not prevail for Jesus gave him a decisive defeat. But the Bible says that that same devil that was defeated in heaven was cast down on earth. Now, I was wondering, who dwells on the earth? Then I noticed that I'm one of them. Thank God you are not. But me, I noticed that I'm one of them. And therefore, verse 12 informs me very well. Verse 12 says, because of what I have discussed above, therefore, mm, rejoice, O heavens, and you will dwell there. Ah, rejoice. Why is there rejoicing in heaven? The answer is, the dragon has been cast out. Not so? Mm -hmm. Talk to me. The next word is, rejoice all you earth. Yeah? Come with me, friends. The Bible says, but woe unto you. Who? Those who dwell on and those who dwell on the sea. That is why people say we went underground to get to riches. The devil has two operational bases. <laughs> on the earth and and the Bible says woe unto you that dwell on the earth. And the reason is simple. The Bible says because the devil he has come for a holiday. What surprised me is I even wanted to see whether this new King James version of mine is the correct one. Because the Bible told me the devil has come down having great wrath. Not for a picnic. And then he's armed with another interesting thing. He's aware and is knowledgeable to the fact that he has but little time. So he's not a time waster. Now let me spiritualize this one. Let me talk to you about the spirituality of this. This is what the Bible is simply saying. There is a time Jesus said that when the demons are cast out of your house, they go out. They wander. And then when they get there, they come back seeking to know whether the house has been guarded. And if they find it's empty, they walk in. And the worst state is, the second one is more troublesome than the first one. Now, this is the spirituality of the matter in terms of Revelation 12. The Bible says, you are as joyful as the direction of the devil in your life. You didn't capture me. The Bible says, rejoice, O you heaven, because the devil has been cast out. But woe unto you the earth because he's coming in that direction. When you take it in the spiritual realm, this is what the Bible is saying. That when a man says yes to Jesus, Jesus comes and abides in his life. And when he dwells in his life, the devil cannot come in. That's why Paul can say rejoice always. And again I say rejoice because you can rejoice since the devil cannot have access to your life. So the Bible says, you know, Jesus went to the tombs and met a man that was cutting himself in pieces, breaking chains because the devil was ruling his life. A man of many sorrows. But when Jesus came and the son of God, he says, I rebuke the devil, get out of my servant. And the Bible says the man was at peace. Rejoice. The devil <laughs> has been cast out. 
Thanks be to Jesus. But let me make a summary of this in this way. Because our time is fast spent. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, chapter 2 verse 3 and 4, Paul says these words to his young friend. He says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Paul is saying, the moment you describe that you are in a state of war, that state of war defines how you behave. And that's why I'm simply saying when you get behind the scenes and see the struggle there, then you see what God is doing. Then you will organize your life in such a way that your life is putting on the full armor of God. And that's why Paul says to the Ephesian church, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Yes, be strong, put on the old armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yes, put on the old armor of God because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against only cheap things. We wrestle against principalities. We wrestle against powers. We wrestle against the, uh, the, 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 the forces of evil in this present age. We wrestle against the host of spirituality in the wicked of heavens up there. And all this collective thing demands that you put on the whole armor of God. Because a man in war does not behave like the ordinary people. It is not business as usual because you know what's behind the scene. You know that it's not business as usual. And therefore you will put on the helmet of salvation. You will put on the breastplate of righteousness. You will take in your hand the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. You will take in the other hand the shield which is the faith. That you may be able to push away the darts of the enemy as he casts them before you. But you also will put on the blessed, the worst you guard yourself with the truth. Because you know that the weapons of God are the only ones that are victorious. And in your feet you put on the preparation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ah, Many things I would like to tell you. But time is gone. And I'm very conscious of that. Let, allow me say this few. <laughs> you, 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 you have excited me. I feel excited already when I talk about the war. The heavenly war. I'm not talking about this one of Congo, Uganda. Did you see those artilleries that they were using to throw the bombs? If you live in that village, my friend, even when you don't want the intestines will move in and out. When you are in a state of war, it's not business as usual. I was a young kid in the war that brought the president. We used to stay out in the banana, you know, plantation. At night, you hide yourself. They are coming. They are coming. They are coming. Then you hear the gambuts. And then, even me as a baby, I was a younger boy and praying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And, 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 and then I became a problem because my neighbor began to tell my grandmother, I'm, I'm saying, Jesus, Jesus, I don't know the things, but Jesus is able to deliver, and he delivered us that night because they saw no one. But let me talk to you. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, Paul says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not wrestle according to the flesh. It's true you have flesh and blood, but your weapons of warfare are not of flesh and blood because he says, for our weapons of warfare are mighty in God because they are not carnal. They are for pulling down strongholds. You pull them down. But I was wondering, what kind of strongholds are we talking about? And Paul answers it. These weapons of God are for casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God to bring every thought into captivity 
to the obedience of Jesus Christ. In other words, the battle is here. The battle is in the mind and the battle is in your heart and God wants you to put on the right weapons to defeat the enemy in the name of Jesus. May God bless you, friends. I will bring part two next time when God gives me the chance. But today, this is what I came to tell you. It is bigger than you think. When God gives you a revelation of what's behind the scenes, you will behave differently. You will support your church better. You will support your pastors better. And this is where I want to end with this story of where our victory lies. One day, <laughs> the king of Syria, I like kings. The king of Syria wanted to attack the king of Israel. And he brought his army close to the camp of Israel and he began to plot a strategic way of attacking them. So he had a strategic plan. Don't you have strategic plans? Uh -huh, thank God. I also have one. I had one for conquering my wife. It succeeded. But now you must have a strategic plan. And so I, the, the, the king of Syria gets a strategic plan and he says, I'm going to attack from this corner, from this corner, and from this corner. And he sat back, he said, they are finished. Then a lousy man in a cave, not in a mansion, in a cave called the prophet, Elisha. Eh? His eye was good. So he said, I said, ah, sure. He sent a message to the king. These people are plotting to come. They want to pass by the southern wing, but don't pass there. You just pass here. And when you get there, hammer them. He went and hammered them. They went back. They said, this time we must plot better. More time. More expertise. More strategy. And the poor man, the prophet, was sleeping. The eye became good. He saw. He told the king of Israel, ah, they are coming again, but this time they are coming through the north. Go past this way, hammer them. And he did the same. Now the king of Syria said to all his army officers, come here. There is someone in this very place who is telling Israel what we are plotting. There is no other explanation. How, does, how do they know that we are coming and we are passing here and they invade and then they attack us? Someone here is a traitor, treason. And one bold staff member. King, before you slaughter us, let me give you some piece of information you had no idea about. In Israel, they are not an ordinary kingdom. They have an office called the office of the prophet. Eh? That office is the eye of God to the people. So whatever you are plotting, they know. Even what you do in the bedroom, the man said, that is dangerous. <laughs> because many things happen in the bedroom. In the bedroom, men beat up their wives. Ah! No, no, and they are good elders. So you cannot expose what's in the bedroom. So the king said, we cannot allow, we must bring that man here now. So they came to attack the man. And the man was sleeping. And the servant woke up, came out, and saw the chariots on the mount. <laughs> he said, we are finished. He runs back in and says, prophet, stop sleeping. You have been sleeping, you are an old man, but this time things are serious. The prophet said, what things are serious? He says, you are an old man, come I show you. The prophet comes out and says, what is the problem? And I say, are you crazy? Even the eyes are full. Can't you see the army? The army here, the army. And the man of God whose eye is good. <laughs> I'm talking about a good eye. <laughs> and the man of God said, relax, my boy. You are still young to know these things. But let me tell you, he that is with the Lord is never afraid because the Lord has given him a vision of what victory is all about. And so he says, ah, ah. On the hills, what you do not see, they are chariots of fire. They which are for us are greater than they who have attacked us. Am I speaking to you? And the Bible says, the, the young man said, I can't see. And then the prophet said, God, make his eye good. 
that he may see. And lo and behold, the man saw the chariots of fire. And the man stood up and said, Victory is ours in the name of Yahweh. Hallelujah. I want to submit to you, you are more than conquerors in Jesus' name. How good is your eye? Is it better than before? Praise God for the message. Thank you. Pastor Bita Mazire, may God bless you for that message. Choristers, come and we close the, uh, the message with song number 304. 304. Let us rise, let us rise. They can do what they do behind the scenes. But our God is mightier than their schemes. And we are more than conquerors in Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, much is going on. Some we know, but much we do not know. And like a flood, it can burst upon us. But we thank you because we have a revelation in Jesus Christ. We are a people of the prophecy, and you have made known of these things even before they could come. We cast our lives in your hands. Help us, Lord, that we can resist into getting so absorbed in the affairs of this world. That we may entertain the desire to always dress ourselves with the full armor, that we may be more than conquerors in Jesus. I proclaim a blessing upon your people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And through Jesus, may everything be done to the glory of his holy name. Now to him who is able to keep us all from falling and present us before his glorious Father. He that is able to grant us more victory than we anticipate. To him we submit now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. <laughs>